Welcome to the Losers Club. Come on in. So Thanksgiving Thursday, 1995, they were going to close because it's Thanksgiving. So uh, myself and a few of the other guys said, all of a sudden, uh, say our parents are dead, everybody's gone, uh, we have nowhere to be on Thanksgiving, so you will open for us. I said, well, Jim, it's Thanksgiving and I'm with my family. They said, we have nowhere else to go. So I got up and put my pants on and went down to the parchment farm. I opened up the doors and went in the kitchen and fed them all turkey sandwiches and cranberries and, and uh, um, got them fed and they played some and blew their horns and played their guitars and we sat and reminisced until about 2.30 in the morning. So we all designated at that time that we got no family, nowhere to go, we're spending Thanksgiving at a goddamn bar. We are losers. That's the origination of the Losers Club. <laughs> I called them misfits, Jim called them losers. They took that and ran with it. When I sold the place in 97, they moved and Jim kind of kept it rolling and all the musicians would flock and come around every Tuesday night or whatever night he saw fit and uh, they'd show up because he was there. The common thread of the longtime members of the club is people who didn't give it up after six months and think, I have to get a real job. This makes me nervous because you never know where your, where your next dollar is going to come from. I have to get a real job. A lot of us kept at it, succeeded. And by God, some of us actually own houses. Oh my God. And who knew? And, but the, the, the common thread is music and specifically electric guitar. But there are a few drummers who follow musicians around. Okay? Yes, okay. <laughs> Kenton, North Portland, very pleasant. I had a great family. You know, I had the two brothers, uh, and the parents were great, and uh, we were not rich people by any means, but we didn't go without anything. My dad was a truck driver, so I guess we're uh, lower middle class. We didn't have video games, you went and made up games, you know. We hid in the tall grass in a field or whatever, hide and go seek. It was the, the traditional uh, fairy tale stuff, you know, it was wonderful. A lot of great memories. Very cool. So this is the old neighborhood. It wasn't, we didn't get transplanted around to a bunch of different places, which is very cool. We're coming up on the late Max Market. This is where I used to buy my cigarettes and get my coffee every day, and they'd throw in a free lighter. We we're like family, and it's gone now. Right there, my first real girlfriend, Ruby Oquist, eighth grade. She was, it was her idea. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Don Lee's used cars. So I got my 54 Plymouth, my 60 Falcon. How many times did I have to get on a bus to ride down this street to go downtown? God. Hot Fellows Hall. I've always wanted to do a gig in that. We'll go down my street now. We play King of the Mountain and the grass would grow. Might be that tall. We're little kids. So we had trails going through the grass, and that was our cool hideouts in the summertime and whatnot. Some hippie pipe dope shop. Get out of here with that. 
nobody in the neighborhood locked their doors day or night. Neighbors would show up in each other's back porch with homemade baked goods all the time. There's the Rosses. Bob Ross was my pal. He had older sisters that had uh, Elvis records and stuff. This is the house I grew up in. Things gone to hell in a handbasket since those days. Here's our old house. We lived there from 54 to 59. For some reason, it was like that whole generation, that culture, it was electric guitars and hot rods kind of became synonymous. If I'm singing about 60s hot rods, you know, that's the stuff I grew up with. So that's my connection with my youth. You know, I'm still real, it's real, you know, we're real together. Hot rods and guitars, they're both curvy and, and painted with candy colors. And they're loud and they're precision machinery, you know. A Stratocaster looks a lot like a Bonneville salt flat, you know, land speed record holder, you know. Well, it's got, it's got uh, some kind of a power brake thing. You, the, the front wheel's a lock, and then you fire it up, and it's just it's burning rubber, it's still just shaking it like thunder. It's a goddamn slingshot, is what it is. Lonnie drove me in it, and thank God he, he's a race car driver because he can handle it. Well, we get on down to the airport road. I think it's probably in a little 44. While you're rolling on 20, do you understand?
him blow up this motor and his shoe was shot. I thought she said that 40 was nothing but stock. Well, I won me a bill with a three pump and a fold. Leave him like punch, plainer than gold. Like 16 million men have spent beside that kind of inspired blend of technique and um, and soul you know which is which is a great thing I mean he's a, a you know because he can do you get the feeling he can do most anything listening to um, Misi play you know like one of those lunatic solos I mean it was like a you know like a drunk falling down the stairs and yet at the end he's still you know WC fields with the martini still held high hadn't spilled a drop and and you, you expected to hear like this big clunk and and that would be a kitchen sink and and, and there would be a voice from the sky saying there it is me it's the only thing you forgot in that solo you know I mean it was just it was crazy stuff <laughs> Yeah, Jim Meese as a guitar player is fabulous. I mean, he's, he's got all the chops. Something extraordinary about his playing, super hot picker, but then he goes beyond that into this realm and it's, uh, it's just this level that uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody else do. It's like, what, you, what the hell are you doing? You're, you're crazy or you're going crazy or something? And then, then he wraps it up and, oh, okay. Well, that was cool, sorry I, sorry I got so upset. <laughs> hey. It's a surprise factor. If you can go see guitar players, they can be really good, but you know the next move they're gonna make. So I've always focused on, this ain't what you expected to come up. If I think about my solo ahead of time, it's not very interesting. If I just go on autopilot, the brain goes away, this comes out and I have no idea why. I, you know, I've been blessed with that, thank you, but I have no idea why or how. Yeah, this is a, our hangout in about 60, 61, 62. We used to stand around these bars here, these parallel bars, and do tricks, discuss life. One of our gang was a guy named Jim Crum, ne'er-do-well guy that came from north of Columbia Boulevard in the, from those little uh, shack villages, things that were in the industrial between factories and stuff. He had a Stella guitar, and he shows up one day. With, he's banging away on it, and he goes, Come on, I, uh, I want to go. Let's go down to the lavatory here, where it's all tile inside. I'm going to play the guitar, and it's going to sound. It'll sound just like an electric. And then we thought, whoa, an electric, whoa. But it was all tile, and he, he says, That's, now "Listen to this." Na 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 na. He says, "Don't that sound like electric guitar?" You know, the natural reverb. You know, and we're like, it sure does. Wow. You have to have had some time when you saw a guitar, 
you know, and it's like a, a, it just impressed you as the coolest damn thing that you ever saw. And then you heard that music and you were gone. And, and I think that happened to both Musi and Bradley. She loves you, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't until we saw the Beatles in 64 on Ed Sullivan, they kind of presented a schematic of how to make a band, you know. Bass does this rhythm guitar and lead guitar and drum. Ooh, and then we got the idea of how to make a band. Turtle Vandemar, he lived a few blocks from me, and um, his dad bought him a Les Paul Jr. and this little K amp that was just the terrible tone, but it was loud, and so it was really cool. We'd hang out on his uh, back patio there and learn to play guitars, and then we met this guy at our high school, Robbie Smith, played great drums, just awesome drummer. Oh, and then Joel Ewing played bass, and he was, he was from our neighborhood. Then we had a little four-piece band going, and uh, we did real good. It just sounded great. And then Turtle left, and then we got Stu Dodge, and John Ward played blues harp really good. And then the three of us, we were this well-oiled machine, so we had this really hot band, and then played all the hippie dances and stuff. My father in the 30s and 40s, before moving to Portland, played in the big bands in uh, the East Coast, because he lived in New York, and they, they would play like all the resorts, and they'd go to Cleveland all the time. And using the original Commodores, which is like a 10 or 12 piece, you know, the, the Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman type orchestra. When World War II broke out, he was playing on a live radio show in Cleveland, and they interrupted the broadcast to announce World War II. Ooh. My brother, who's seven years older than I am, would come home with the 45s by Elvis and Little Richard back in the mid-50s when they were new. And I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And he would come running in the house from the record store and put the needle on there right away. And, wow, listen to that, you know. That was the coolest thing I ever heard. That's when it started. I saw somebody on television with a solid body guitar. It wasn't the big arch top. It was this cool little electric thing with an electric cord coming out. And I thought, is that the living end or what? And that's all I thought about from the time I was about four, maybe five, and they got me little toy plastic guitars. By the time I was eight, they just got tired of listening to it, so they got me a real guitar. The first electric guitar I had was a K Speed Demon. Three pickups and seven knobs. The amount of knobs was very important. A lot of my friends that same Christmas got the Speed Demon with one pickup and two knobs. Ah, I was king of the block. Yeah. The guitar intro on Don't Be Cruel, do, 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 do. That is so electric guitar. Ooh, I love that. I was just a little idiot kid. But when I was 11 years old, Walk Don't Run by The Ventures came out, and the whole song was electric guitar. It wasn't backing up somebody singing. Well, I ran up to Gateway Records, which is at least a mile. I was probably there in 10 seconds buying that record after I heard it on the radio. Those are early influences. First paying gig. I was 15 or 16. And uh, a friend of my brother's who's older than I am was a singer and he had nightclub gigs around town. He didn't have a band. So he hired us little idiots to play at the Town Mart, which is a big fancy nightclub out on Killingsworth, kind of by the airport somewhere, 72nd or wherever the hell it is, I don't remember. I can't remember if we got 10 or 15 bucks or what, you know, mid 60s. We're just happy to be there. But we're in school, high school, and we had to play till I think 2.30 in those days. I'm still tired. <laughs> from getting up and going to school the next day. Okay, we're going into the Elmer's Starting Gate Lounge. This is my uh, 
hang out in my library. It's where I study my software manuals. This is where I've become the computer genius that I am. So let's go into the Elmer's Starting Gate Lounge. Yes, sir. Mr. Scott, how are you doing? Good. Elmer's Starting Gate Lounge. In 1948, this whole area was underwater. No, my, my grandpa, he's the one that turned me on to this place. Because this was one of his favorite places. So I was hanging with him during his last few years as we frequented this joint. Yeah, I serve Steve pancakes. Pancakes, yeah. Pancakes. Yeah, yeah. Kelly, <laughs> happening, a pro. What have you guys been talking about? Anything exciting? Usual stuff, man. Usual stuff. Yeah. Area 51. What are they trying to cover up there? This, yeah, I guess, you know, they're doing a lot of their military stuff there, you know. Well, they're, yeah, that's they're, they're, they're trying to cover up their... They've invented these tiny dragonfly replicas, mutant dragonflies with cams that are... No, I don't. <laughs> out here is my hobby. Very dark and dreary looking, isn't it? Uh, a lot of people play music for a hobby, but when that's your job, you should have some other kind of outlet. And these are model kits of all the monsters and creatures from the old horror and sci-fi movies. I mean, no matter what age group you are, you've seen the Frankenstein, the Bride of Frankenstein. So that's what we're looking at. I don't ordinarily allow humans in my collection, but back there, you can see we have the Three Stooges. I make exceptions for the Three Stooges. And you got your Martians, like the old Invasion of the Flying Saucer Man, 1958. I, I was stunned to find that they actually make such things. That's from the 50s, uh, early 60s episode of Twilight Zone with William Shatner, where he keeps seeing the creature out on the wing of the airplane. One of my favorites is The Day the Earth Stood Still, 1950 or 51 and Gort the Robot. Anyway, a friend of mine here in Portland collects the robots and creatures and uh, went to his house and had my picture taken with the actual Gort robot. This is the original one from the 50s. Ooh, I love this. All the sunny California Everybody there, a messed up water, messed up air. Get it one by east to 101. I took a hard left, just kept going. I didn't stop until my head got clear. A brand new world, but man, it's cold up here. Definitely of that generation that your whole aesthetic and cultural uh, outlook is framed by, you know, the, the arrival and rise of rock and roll, whether that's Elvis or the Beatles or the Stones or Dylan. She used to come to me when I called her. Oh, where was my strawberry roll? Her big bright eyes. Love me with bad words When we're together, or we're home It took me several years of, I created several piles of scrap paper, but, you know, it took a long time to get get going on songwriting. That was hard work. We always roll in an upper direction Into the bright blue beyond The clouds roll by higher than high and Steve's listens very widely. His stuff kind of has that rootsy sound to it most of the time, but he's very cognizant with all the rest of rock and pop history as it, you know, he'd come up through the years. When we're together, oh, we're home.
He had a style, and it's still his style. Of course, it's refined over the years, but it's great. It sounds like that uh, wonderful kind of late 50s chrome-plated guitar sound, you know. And he's also an incredible songwriter. He could be a world famous for Christ's sake, you know. Should be. I got great big shoes, great big feet. Here I come now, dragging my meat. I'm spanking style. The love monster. Said I was spanking style. The love monster. Spanking style. So we were kind of just messing with it, making up some verses on the spot. And, and, uh, and I just took it and made a, a, a funny rap song out of it. I can't remember why, but there you go. <laughs> He's got an amazing ear for, you know, incorporating elements and different elements, and that's a tune that really does it. Of course, it isn't, it isn't as good as his line in Shop Girl, where he talks about complicated underwear from France. His thing is about that connection that you get when you're 20 feet away or, or you're, you're right next to him and he's peeling off some really great solo where you can see the soul that this guy's got. <laughs> And uh, a guy named Buck Munger, he was an agent in L.A. and he handled some big names. So he convinced a bunch that he would put a band together of Portland people, bring them to L.A., do nothing but original material, which he did. And so the guys from Portland said, oh, we know this great young blues guitar player in Portland that we can get to come. His name is Jim Meese. He's 19 years old. He's really great. So Jim Dunlap, the lead singer, um, hitchhiked back to Portland and got his Vespa out of storage and put Jim Meese on the back of the Vespa. Jim carried his guitar on his back and they rode 31 straight hours down I-5 straight to the Los Angeles recording session. So the first time I ever met Jim Meese, he was straight off of the back of the Vespa. And uh, you know, it, that's commitment. So we pretty much starved to death, made records and starved to death. When they first got there, they rented a house at the beach and they soon ran out of money and uh, they ended up sleeping in my office under the desks. We left our home one by one and every day holding on. And then we signed the big record deal. Then all of a sudden, we're on the label, we got the whole deal going, we're gonna book tours, blah, blah, blah. And uh, two of the guys in the band, this is during the Vietnam era, got busted for draft evasion. And the record company said, that's it, it was over. Move back to Portland. When the big Summer of Love ride was over, and then playing all these lonely uh, adult nightclubs that were like on the skids because their audience was gone. That was kind of a low point, because I thought, well, this is the end of the ride, you know, I, I'm gonna have to, you know, get rid of this guitar. It's been fun, but I gotta, I gotta get a job.
changed the tavern laws here. So all these taverns open up. It gave us all kinds of places to play. All of a sudden we're playing four and five nights a week in bars. Huge, huge amounts of people out, you know, looking for something to do. This psychedelic hippie era group, they're pretty much going out all the time. And so all of a sudden there's all this work dumped on you. You could work seven nights a week if you wanted. When I moved back in September 69 from LA, the Wrinkle Experience, started a band with Lloyd Jones, Paul DeLay, a couple other guys. And we always managed to have gigs. I mean, there were a little, a few lean times, but. Not like the big haired rock guys, you know, the, the, the big feather haircuts and the spandex. They used to look down their nose at us and, oh, that blues thing will never last. Well, we're still here. They ended up washing dishes how many years ago, and who knows whatever happened to them. They don't play music anymore. We started a group in 71 called the Sleazy Pieces. Benson started to write songs right away and uh, really cool stuff you know some of it was like too weird to comprehend but a lot of really great stuff I thought and, and uh, so I, that inspired me I wanted to, to write songs like like he did There was a period where all of a sudden all these great songs just came bounding out of him. Someday her name won't even come to me. Let's poker! Somehow promoter saw us and liked us. And we ended up being the warm-up band for BB King. I knocked on his dressing room, told him he was the first blues guy I ever saw. That's how I got into this. Come on in, have a drink and sit down. And then on the road, afterwards, he would uh, invite you over to the hotel room, take off the, sh the shoes, put the feet up on the thing, and he would tell you road stories till the sun came up. It seems there were a lot of people, you know, snorting up a lot of stuff. And, uh, um, you know, you're kind of seeing those little uh, uh, movies go on all around you, you know, about people kind of snorting away uh, careers and marriages and houses. But in the music thing, you weren't cool if you didn't do it. You weren't part of the culture, and it was awful. You had, like, the impressive rock stars handing you free, here you go. And wow, you want to be like them when you're young and vulnerable, and that's how that all took place. It's one way to it's one way to make yourself broke. It's one way to drive yourself nearly crazy. But it's also a way to play a lot, you know, to cram a lot into a short period of time. So would things have turned out differently? I don't know. It's pretty hard to say, really.
because that suggests that a moderate path might have led to greater success. I think you pretty much wind up where you're going to be. Yeah, I'm guilty of, of being part of that, and I wish it would have never happened. But it's a long time ago, and it's way long over with. Thank God. We didn't really actually play in a band together until I joined his blues band in 1990. You don't say one without the other, and um, when you talked about hot guitar players, there's always been you know, hot guitar players filtering in and out. Those guys have always been there. tip we got tonight, so you don't want to film this. <laughs> I wonder how much there is here. Let me count. I can do that. I just, it, it was like a wad in the tip jar. Wow. Bunch of guitar students that I teach every week, unless I'm on the road or whatever. And some of them have been, been playing a long time. They're so good that I have to come up with new stuff just to show them. And actually, a lot of my original instrumentals on my CDs come from stuff that I made up to, that I came up with to show these guys something new. I got to come up with something different. It can't be the same old crap. <laughs> approach I'm taking is um, get the student going on a few chords and licks and stuff that are fun, you know. If, if they're having fun, then, you know, the practice takes care of itself.
When I was a kid, I listened to the, I heard the 50s instrumentals on the, the local radio station, and it was electric guitar, and I thought, boy, that is so adult. I'd never be able to do that. That's like really grown up, you know? So now that I'm over 50, I do this stuff from the 50s that I grew up liking. All the instrumentals, just, I always love those. It was so, paint such a picture, you know. I mean, that stuff is still so great. It's got this kind of majesty. Well, I, I made the decision, you know, am I going to like, you know, be a commercial artist, you know, go to college, or am I going to start another band and hop on this deal, you know, and I hopped on the deal and lived off it for 25 years. 
But I look back and think, did I ever think about like growing up and getting a real job? And for some reason when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and be a guitar player. And now that I'm in my 50s, I still want to grow up and be a guitar player. I, I never thought about anything else. My dream was to like be able to go downtown and play some gigs in a bunch of different clubs, you know. I never did have aspirations for anything more than that, you know. I wanted to have a good time and doing it, and I have and I am. I mean, you have to work all day on the phone, going to the post office, mailing promo stuff, updating websites. You have to do that all day just to make sure you have a place to play every night. As far as the job security, it's, 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 it's kind of scary, but not on 50-something, I'm still doing it all the time. Well, I'm not interested in the music business at all, and, and so it's kind of like down to listen to the guitar, and that's all I care about. And so the game for me now is, is if I can get away with that, you know, otherwise I don't care. You know, I don't want to know about, I don't want to hear about your numbers on the door, and I don't care, you know, I don't care if anybody shows up, and, you know, I don't care how many drinks you sell. All I care is plugging the guitar in and you know, hearing that sound. Sorry, but <laughs> I could care less, you know, about anything else. I'd like to be more rich and more famous, but wouldn't we all? When I was a teenager, when I was a teenager, I thought I'm going to grow up and be a rock star. We all wanted to do that. No, that didn't happen, but I had a lot of music awards. I travel all over the world. I mean, ever since the first time I went to Europe, I thought I have arrived, and you have. I mean, if you got CDs in major stores, I mean, our CDs are in. Tower Records all over the world, and we two are all over, and uh, that's not bad. Not bad at all. Well, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the show.